as we continue in uh, John 17, I want to encourage you to try and turn on your right brain so that instead of attaching left brain to all the information, you let your right brain be in awe of what God's telling you about himself. So this is more, this isn't about passing a test when we're done on the information, but allowing yourself to be like a child in awe of what your God is like. He's your father, but he's your brother, and he's your comforter. And so as we look at what Jesus is praying, we need to try and enter into it and consider what is the real way that I'm attaching to this and how do I need to, to get to know God better than I know him before. So we're picking up at verse 11 where we were last last time. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, I'm going to get this part out of the way, because it's not the focus. Jesus is referring to Judas Iscariot here, who at this point is out meeting with the, the religious leaders, getting his 30 pieces of silver, and planning to lead them to the Garden of Gethsemane where he's going to hand Jesus over to them. When Jesus is talking here, he says not one of them, meaning the them he's talking about, has been lost. And then he clarifies Judas wasn't one of them. He's the son of destruction. That's what he was the whole time. And it's according to scripture that Judas did what he did. So this is not an example of one of them, meaning Jesus' sheep, being snatched out of his hand, the devil got to him, and one of Jesus' sheep was taken away. Jesus is saying, I haven't lost any of my sheep, but among my sheep was this son of destruction, and he has been lost. He's the only one, because I will not lose my sheep. Does that make sense of that for you? That he's making that clarification? So that's all I want to say on that, because... The, the first part is the strongest emphasis. So, this is what we'll be focusing on. Jesus is now asked the Father to keep us in the Father's name. And now he says, I have already done that. While I was with them, I have kept them in your name, the name you gave me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost. So Jesus is saying, Father, would you keep them in your name? And he puts in there, and I believe this is for our benefit, to say the way you would understand the Father keeping us in his name is, look at the way Jesus kept his disciples in the Father's name. So if you want to know how he's doing that with you, how the Father is doing that with you, look at how Jesus did that with them. So I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of that but more to get it into our minds, when you're reading about Jesus relating to his disciples, taking care of his church, think of that as that's the way the Father is now taking care of us, keeping us, guarding us. So, the, I, because we've talked about Hebrew parallelism before, that they rhyme thoughts, not words, I see that that could be in here. I kept them in your name, I have guarded them. They're synonymous expressions. What does it mean to keep them? Well, guard them, to protect them. And so that's clarified there. In Luke 2, verse 8, it says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. So when Jesus is talking about keeping and guarding, he's the shepherd. He's saying, Father, I have shepherded the ones you gave me. I have kept them in your name. I have guarded them from the evil one. Uh, when, when 
Jesus was telling Peter that he was going to not deny him three times. He said, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. And when you come back, feed your brothers. You don't take care of the flock. So e even in that, we see ways that Jesus was guarding. He was praying for Peter, interceding him, interceding for him. So the theme of God keeping his people in his name is all through this. And that's why I'm emphasizing this isn't about your left brain getting the information. It's does your right brain attach to that so that when you are in situations where the world, the flesh, and the devil are stirring up your emotions because you're scared, uh, you're worried, you're anxious, if we could attach to him, keeping us in his name, right brain, in the spirit, we would feel differently. We, we would actually feel things in scary situations that aren't fear-based. They're based on a, a love-trust relationship where God is keeping us in his name. And based on things that are coming in Canada, this is going to be very real to us, that we're going to have to know God like this. So, you remember that I have talked about this so many times. Whenever you see in the Old Testament the, the phrase, the Lord, where all four letters are capitalized, it always is meaning the personal name Yahweh, right? So, when Jesus says, I kept them in your name, this is the name. That's the Father's name. It is the name the Father uses all through the Old Testament. So Jesus says, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. So what I want to do is show the significance of us thinking not... What, what bothers me about whoever decided millennia ago to stop saying Yahweh and to say the Lord instead is that if you just listen to someone reading the Bible, it sounds like a title. The Lord said this. You know, you read through Psalms. The Lord did this. The Lord saved us. And we don't actually get the sense that that's not what it says. It says Yahweh did this. Yahweh saved us. Yahweh rescued us. It's a name. It's way more personal than a title. So I, want, I hope to help us get to it attached to that. So number six, th this is something that the Jewish people pronounce, they, they remind each other of, it's a blessing that, that it belongs to Israel. So Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his son saying, thus ye shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, and now God's giving a, a breathed out God-inspired blessing that the priest could pronounce over Israel. Okay? Yahweh bless you and keep you. Now that's not what it says in your English Bible. In your English Bible it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. But just hearing that, now, like the difference between a title, what sounds like a title, and a name. Okay? So, the actual way God was expressing it is, when you tell the people this blessing, it's, tell them by my name that I am here, I want to bless them and keep them. Okay? So this idea of keeping goes way back to God's blessing on the people of Israel. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Okay? So by name, when, when you think of Yahweh's name, he's saying, when you think of my name, you should be thinking of someone's face shining on you with love and blessing and grace that I'm shining on you to, to bring blessing into your life. That's what my name should feel like to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. 
So lift up his countenance, the way he appears. So when you look at him, the countenance is what you pick up on from the smile, the eyes, the, the gestures. You can tell what that person is feeling. And, and what God himself wanted in the hearts of the people was that his name would be associated with someone who wanted his countenance to, to come upon them to be there, to, to, that they'd see him in things they were going through so they would have peace about those things. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. So again, the English translations totally take away what that means, my name, because we think, well, it says the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, my name. Like, no, it's Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh, that is, that blessing will put my name upon the people. And I will bless them as my name is upon them. Now, can you hear Jesus' words bringing together all these beautiful things? You know, Father, keep them in your name. Like this. Bring this to the church. Make this the thing that for the rest of the new covenant, for the rest of the church, this is the blessing on the people. Keep them in your name. The name you gave me. I have kept them in your name. The name you gave me. So I, I hope you can see how significant that is. So I kept them in your name, which you have given me. We need attachment to the name for the encouragement of the keeping. For you to say, God's keeping me in his name, for you to feel any emotion about that, you have to be attached to his name. Right? If his name doesn't do anything to you, and, and we know what, I mean, we know what it's like to hear someone's name, and just their name says, I, I want to be with them, right? There's some people you hear their name, and immediately, yeah, are they coming over? You know, or someone else's name, it's like, uh, they're not as cool today, are they? You know, you, you don't want to see them. So, so much of this, how you're attaching to his name will affect how you feel about him keeping you. And so I want to put a, a bit of emphasis on that. So it's your name which you have given me. That's the focus. What I want to do is show how do you get from Yahweh's name in the Old Testament to Jesus' name in the New Testament and, and Jesus saying, I've kept them in your name, but it's the name that you've given me. So I want to show how this all ties together because for me, it, it's amazing to see how God has so clearly unfolded these things. So, the name Yahweh is the, the, the divine name that was given to Moses, and it means, I am who I am. Which I believe, it's almost impossible to put that name into a, a, a definition or translation, because it's trying to describe in space, time, matter, and energy something that is in eternity. It's in a different realm. So God, who's in a different realm, is telling Moses, I am here with you to deliver my people out of Egypt. And Moses says, what name am I supposed to say? Like, they knew the gods of Egypt. You know, so Moses saying, well, what name do I give them that would assure them that this is going to happen? And he says, we'll give them this name, Yahweh, which is, I am who I am. So, in Exodus 3, it says, God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, which is Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Which really makes it sad that someone decided... They're so afraid of mispronouncing his name that they decided we can't do it. 
we will switch it to another name. And and they totally lost that. But God wanted that name. This isn't this isn't an authoritative thing I'm going to say. It's a personal thing. In our daycare, year after year, we have these one-year-olds who get to know us, and eventually they call us by name. And sometimes we laugh because it might be half our name, or it might be the end with a different beginning, or, you know, but all of a sudden someone, between the three of us, someone says, they're saying your name. And as soon as I know that funny sound that they keep saying is my name, I think it's amazing. It's like they've connected that I have a name and, and they refer to me that way. I honestly can't imagine God giving a Hebrew name, which is four consonants, and they lost the vowels. And if we give it our best effort to pronounce it, he's going to be upset that it wasn't the same two vowels that he intended. I honestly can't imagine him being like that. He gave us his name. And I, I believe because he intended the scriptures to be translated into every language, because his intent was always that people from every tribe and nation, that people pronouncing his name differently in one language or another wouldn't be an issue for him. It's that they knew his name. So, so God, by Yahweh, he's saying, that's my name forever never going to change. So when we see the Lord, it's always Yahweh. That's the name. That's the name Jesus is talking about when he refers to your name, the name that you've given me. So the people who said, we can't pronounce it by name, we don't know the vowels, so, so we don't want to take a chance on lightning striking us, they said, let's replace Yahweh, or the pronunciation Yahweh, with Adonai, which is Hebrew for Lord. So, whenever the Jews would read scriptures where it says Yahweh, they, they left those four consonants in there, but they would pronounce it Adonai, because they knew they could say that. So, later on in, in you know, the Jewish people, they actually totally lost this. They lost the name Yahweh. And it was now Adonai, the Lord. In the Greek, the word Kyrios is Lord. And so, where the word Adonai was used in the Old Testament, Kyrios would replace it. If, if someone was explaining in Greek what a verse in Hebrew said, where God's name was, they would say Kyrios instead of Adonai. Jesus' name, in this, this is in the Greek, would sound like Jesus. So. Is that where Yeshua comes from? No. Where, there's nothing wrong with referring to Jesus as Yeshua. Yeshua is essentially the Hebrew word. Hebrew name that in Greek is Jesus. The same way as we would call someone Peter in another language it's Petra, another it's Petros. Like in, in different languages you pronounce it differently. There's a movement that is by I think Jewish Christians that are saying in Hebrew Jesus wouldn't have been given the name Jesus, he would have been given the name Yeshua. Which is Joshua in English. There's nothing wrong with calling Jesus Yeshua as just that would be his name in Hebrew or the Old Testament. The movement to replace that name is wrong because Jesus is the name God gave to his son. All through the New Testament, it's only Jesus. He's never referred to as Yeshua. So it's okay to take Old Testament names like Emmanuel that's an Old Testament name. The only time it's referred is to confirm him as Jesus. That his name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. But he's never called that for the rest. He's called Jesus. So Jesus is the English translation? Jesus is English. 
Jesus is Greek. Yeshua isn't even the Hebrew way of saying Jesus. It's what the Hebrew counterpart would be. If that makes sense. So, I have no problems with that word, like in a song, referring to Jesus as Yeshua, as long as we don't get on their bandwagon and say, we're supposed to be doing it the Hebrew way. It's like, no. The inspired way is to call him Jesus. Now, so, Jesus, with his name Jesus, is called Lord. And I want to connect how these all come together, or try to. Hey, this is Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, Yahweh, that is my name. So I am Yahweh, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. So, I want you to think, his name is Yahweh, and he does not give his glory to anyone else. Okay? So all the other names of the gods, he will not give his glory. When Israel, when Moses was up on the mountain and they decided to make a golden calf, what did they name it? They said, here's Yahweh. He's the one who brought us out of Egypt. Yeah, it's, it's shocking. But they attributed to this golden calf that this is Yahweh who brought us out of Egypt. That explains the following punishment. <laughs> yes, that's why there was such a severe punishment. But let's just keep that in mind. Yahweh is my name, my glory I give to no other. And Jesus says, I have kept them in your name, the name you have given me. So obviously the Father's not giving his glory to another when he gives his name to his Son. He's giving his glory to Yahweh. Hopefully. Isaiah 45, By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return to me. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. That's Yahweh. Okay? In Philippians 2 about Jesus, it says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and has bestowed on him the name that is above every name. What name is that? It's Yahweh. Jesus isn't the name. Jesus was given the name that is above every name. So Jesus prayed, Father, I've, I've kept them in your name, the name you have given me. I don't know, I hope your right brain's kicking in here because I find this quite fascinating. So that at the name of Jesus, so not at the name Jesus, right? But at the name that Jesus was given. He's been given the name above every name. So that at that name that Jesus was given, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. But how can that happen? Because Yahweh said, to me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Well, it can only be true if Jesus has the Father's name. He is Yahweh, the Son, in the flesh. And so, he's saying, Father, keep them in your name the way I've kept them in your name. And then it says, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what I'm hearing is, because Lord is Kyrios, which is Adonai, which is Yahweh, that's saying Jesus was given the name Yahweh so that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Yahweh. By this time, all the Jewish people would have known, if you're saying Jesus is Kyrios, you're saying this is true of him, which is why the, the religious elite kept picking up rocks to throw at him and, and kill him for blasphemy. Because when they heard Jesus Christ is Lord, if they heard that, then he's claiming this. And that's exactly what Paul's saying. How could Paul say that if Jesus Christ is called Lord, meaning Yahweh, it would be to the glory of God the Father when the Father, Yahweh, said, I will not give my glory to another. It's because Jesus isn't another. 
He is God. He is God coming the flesh. So, Yahweh is the divine name given to Moses, which means I am who I am. Jesus, uh, in John 8, 58, Jesus answering his critics said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Right there, he was claiming the divine name. Remember what the religious people did right after that? They picked up rocks to stone him to death. Because that was the punishment for blasphemy, was to stone someone to death. They knew what he was saying. He was claiming the divine name. So, in his prayer, Father, I have kept them in your name, the name you have given me. You keep them in your name, the name you have given me. Okay? So, in Isaiah 40, verse 3, this is a prophecy. A voice cries, In the wilderness, prepare the way of Yahweh. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Isaiah had no doubt that this was a prophecy about preparing the way for Yahweh, their God. Okay? This is Luke 1, talking about John the Baptist. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. You will go before Kyrios, Yahweh, and John the Baptist is, or, or Zechariah is, is prophesying about his son, you're the one who will prepare the way for Yahweh, but he doesn't say Yahweh, he says Kyrios, the Lord, which is what every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, that Jesus Christ is Kyrios, the Lord. And then Matthew 3, uh, when John the Baptist was born, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Prepare the way of the Lord, that's curious. But the original is Yahweh. And that's why it wasn't blasphemy for Jesus to claim it. So, do we get that, that I find this interesting, you got a name that is switched to a title, and you got a title that is switched to a name. So that at the name of Jesus, we experience what God has given us. So Jesus said, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me. I kept them in your name, which you have given me. Jesus wants us to see that the Father keeping us in his name is identical to Jesus keeping his disciples in the Father's name. So anything you read in the New Testament where it's addressing you to the Father. It's like Jesus is keeping you in the Father's name which he has himself. And so we, Jesus can say to uh, was it Thomas when Jesus said, I'm, I'm going to prepare a home for you. And, and Thomas said, well, you know, show us the Father. And Jesus said, how long do I have to be with you? Have you not, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So it's a beautiful it's so saturated in scripture that that we can have full assurance in the tri, tri the trinity the triune nature of god so i kept them in your name which you have given me i have guarded them i, I want to quickly go through psalm 21 just uh, i'll just read it okay and try not to say anything more i lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come my help comes from Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Yahweh is your keeper. 
Yahweh is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Yahweh will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. Yahweh will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. So I just want to show in that, read Psalm 121, go, have your time with God in there, and, and it'll help you understand how Jesus understood keeping his flock and then praying that the Father would do that for us. Uh, Jude, Jude says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. So, being called, beloved, and kept is part of our inheritance, it's part of our identity. That we are called, we are beloved, and we are kept. That those three things apply to every Christian. You cannot see yourself differently than that. And then he says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So what Jude is saying, you already are called, you are beloved, you are kept. I want to see more mercy, peace, and love growing in your church. Which would be evidence that you are attaching to God's calling, that you are beloved to him, that he's keeping you. And then he ends his tiny letter, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. It's a beautiful picture. Jesus asked the Father, keep them. Keep them in your name. What do you think God is going to do more than anything else to keep you from stumbling? He's going to get you in his word so that he can keep you in his name. Right? If we just keep listening to him, he can keep us in his name. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So if he wants to keep us from stumbling, he's going to keep us in his word so that he can keep us in his name. And to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. That is the result of God keeping us in his name. That one day we will be presented before the throne of heaven blameless and God will have great joy overseeing us there. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now, and forever. Amen. I wanted to end with that because our quest, in a sense, should be, I want to be so attached to the divine name the identity of God, the character of God, and the works of God, that I am so wrapped up in that relationship that I'm not distracted by the world, the flesh, and the devil. I'm not drawn into sin and temptation because I have so much time on my hands, but that I am engrossed with the glory and majesty and dominion and authority of the Father and of the Son, that they are constantly moving my heart to walk in the Spirit, to set my mind on things above. And because my mind is stayed on them, I'm able to walk in peace through any situations. And I can almost I guarantee this, if you're not at peace in something you're going through, you're disconnected from the identity, the character, or the works of God. Probably all three. And so, as we receive Jesus' prayer, that the Father keep us in his name, our part is to say, yes, Father, I would like to get to know you by name so that every time I think of your name, it feels like the best relationship in the world, the best person I could be with right now, the way it would thrill my heart to simply be with the one who loves me most. And so Jesus, I believe, is still praying that. We can join in the prayer, pray it, for our church, for other Christians, and then watch for how he does it. Amen.